In this video, I'm going to explain the maths behind the turret aimer, and I split it into two main parts. The first, which is on this sheet of paper, is calculating the angle above the horizon in order to hit a stationary target at a known range. And then the second part is hitting a moving target, and you can see it's much more complicated since, well, they're moving, and you have to take into account much more stuff. Uh, it's spread over four sheets of paper, and it looks very neat and tidy, but actually this was after a lot of trial and error and final version written up neat. So first, uh, in the first part, where you calculate the angle above horizon, the elevation of a gun, uh, given the range that you have to hit. So here's a rough diagram of how it works. Here's the range, here's yourself, that's shooting the projectile, and here's the enemy and it follows a, a parabolic path, uh, path. This is looking from the side. So first, distance equals speed times time, right? But what distance equals what speed times what time? Uh, the range is the horizontal speed times the flight time. And since horizontal speed can be thought of as independent from vertical speed, since there's no air resistance, that's what you can do. So now the job is to uh, find an expression for horizontal speed and for flight time. Now keep in mind, I'm actually finding an expression for the range, given the angle first, and then I'm going to rearrange to find an expression for the angle given the range. Uh, since I found that easier to do, and it's easier to just find it that way, then rearrange, and then to try and think about it in the opposite direction. Uh, so, I mean, horizontal vertical speed, that's easy. It's just simple trigonometry. If you imagine uh, the speed in a diagonal direction, it creates a triangle, then it's just uh, the horizontal will be the cosine times the magnitude, and the vertical will be the sine times the magnitude. So yes, uh, horizontal speed is the cosine of theta, theta being what we eventually need to find, uh, the, the gun elevation times the initial speed. And then the flight time is a bit more difficult. Um, if you imagine g is roughly 10, right? So let's say the vertical speed goes up at 100 meters per second initially. Then after one second, it will be 90. After two seconds, it will be 80, then 17, then 60, then eventually zero. And then it has to come all the way back down again because we're assuming equal elevation. So it will be two times the vertical speed over G, like 100 over 10 over 9.81. That'll be how long it takes to go up and two times because it needs to go up and down. So that's how long it will take to fly. And of course, the vertical speed is just the sine uh, times initial speed. I tidied it up a bit. Uh, and now, if you multiply the horizontal speed by the flight time, you can get the range in this equation. And I, I didn't know this, I just looked it up. Uh, sine theta times cosine theta just happens to be half sine 2 theta. And conveniently, the half cancels out with the 2. So you, you end up with the range is 1 over g times the sine of 2 theta times the initial speed squared. And it kind of makes sense. If you increase the speed, if you double it, the range goes about four times because you double the horizontal speed and you double the vertical speed, which doubles the flight time. So now it's just rearranging, um, moving it to the other side, inverse sine divided by two. And eventually you get an expression for the gun elevation given these three variables, uh, the g, the gravity downwards, the range, and as well as the initial speed. So this first part, first part tells you the angle given the range, but it also gives you some useful equations for uh, the flight time as well, which is useful in the later times, because if you think the amount that the enemy moves depends on how long the projectile flies for. Uh, so the two useful equations to be using, or actually, th yeah, two useful equations to be using in the later parts would be the equation for the range, given the angle, as well as the equation for the flight time, given the angle. And you'll see in a moment that they kind of uh, are both used in the more complicated parts and are useful. So now on to the second section, where, uh, where the target is moving. And uh, to, to better visualize it, here's a diagram looking from above. So this is yourself. And this is the enemy initially. So this would be the initial range between you two. Uh, and of course, in this case, since they're moving, the angle also is also starting to be important. 
previously, in this case, the angle that you're, the bearing, like the train of your turret, is just whatever direction the enemy is because they don't move. But in this case, they do move and it starts becoming important to actually also keep track of that and calculate it. Uh, so this is the enemy's initial position and this is uh, their travel direction and this is their uh, travel path. And the distance that they travel, uh, as I said just now, depends on the flight time of the projectile, right? Uh, so it's the computer's job to calculate how much lead to have and how far to aim. So even though this is the initial range at the point of firing, the gun isn't aiming directly at where the enemy is right now, as it predicts where it will be. So this is the direction and range that the gun actually fires. All right. So now that you have this diagram and uh, a few angles and lengths, uh, there's a few steps you take to get an equation for the gun's elevation. And then after you do that, it's easy to get an equation for the gun's train, the bearing. First, you just ignore all the numbers, ignore what all the numbers mean and convert it to a, purely to a geometry problem. It's just the geometry that you learn in school, finally useful for once. And uh, you can substitute the equations for the final range and the flight time from part one. And then you rearrange uh, to get an equation for the gun elevation, which, and, and the gun elevation being the only unknown, so you can solve it. So to actually find the geometry problem, here's the, uh, here's what I've called the variables here. I just made them abbreviated for easier writing. You're assuming that by default, the gun's pointing north, right? So this dashed line here and this dashed line here is the direction of north. So the initially at the point of firing, the enemy will be at some bearing away from north, which I've called B sub I, initial enemy bearing. And then since this is also north um, and you know their travel direction, which is theta, uh, these two are parallel, so that's 180 minus BI. And you know these two, 360 minus these two, you get X. And X is just that, it's just 360 minus these two. And X is useful because you know the initial range, you know their speed, and if you know their speed and the flight time of the projectile, then you can calculate their distance. So you know this distance, you know this distance, you know that angle, you can use the cosine rule to get this final range. And here's just me using the cosine rule with D. And of course, D is just the enemy speed times the flight time. So if you substitute all of these expressions in, you get this one giant long equation. The final range squared is the initial range squared plus the enemy speed squared plus the flight time squared, because these two together is the enemy travel distance. And minus that because cosine rule. So then now these underlying things are the remaining unknowns, right? They are, because the initial range, you input it. That's a, that's a required input. The enemy speed, that's a required input. Uh, same here again. And um, th their initial bearing, as well as their travel direction, they're all required inputs. However, flight time and the final range is what you have to calculate. And this is where the equations from the previous part uh, becomes useful. You can kind of think of this side as the required range uh, in order to hit, uh, given the flight time, right? This side only takes into account flight time. So given how long the projectile flies for, given how far they travel, uh, this side shows, well, it's actually squared, but this side shows how far it needs to go. And this side, uh, given the equation from the previous part that uh, takes into account the, uh, the elevation of the gun, is how far the gun actually shoots. And since both the flight time and the final range depend only on the unknown of the gun elevation, that means that if you just substitute these in, then the gun elevation becomes the only unknown. Uh, so I haven't actually written out here, but if you just imagine this expression gets subbed into there, and this expression gets subbed into there and there, then you have this one giant long equation with everything as constants except the gun elevation. Right? And now you just have to solve that. 
However, uh, that's where I got stuck because what you end up with is uh, final range is in proportion to sine of two times the gun angle. And since it's squared, it will be sine squared to a gun angle, flight time squared as well uh, in relation to sine gun angle. So you have sine squared to gun angle, sine squared gun angle, and sine gun angle all in one expression. And I have no idea how you're supposed to solve that because it's just a mix of different trigonometric things. So after trying for a long time, I gave up the idea of analytically solving it and rearranging it into a single expression for the gun angle itself. Uh, and instead, since I have this equation, I can use trial and error inside code, inside Python on the microcontroller to try different values of the gun angle and see which values cause the left-hand side to equal the right-hand side, right? Because that, that's the final goal. You're trying to find a value for which the two sides have as small a uh, difference as possible. That's the whole point of having an equal sign. Uh, so that will be done by trial and improvement using Python and just assuming you get a, uh, you get a correct value for that. You can then go on to find the bearing, the train of your turret. So now that you know the angle, now that you know how long the projector will fly for, now that you know how far will uh, how far the enemy is at the point of impact, you can look back at this triangle again. And now, uh, now the job is to find the initial bearing plus this x, right? Because that's where you actually need to aim in order to hit this point. So it will be bi plus x and mod three hundred and sixty because this is just one case. You can imagine if the enemy is over here and they're kind of crossing zero, you don't want ha you don't want it to be over three hundred and sixty because that breaks the servos that's trying to uh, trying to actually turn. So mod three hundred and sixty so that it ranges between zero and three hundred and sixty. Now it's just a simple use of the sine rule, right? So the sine of x over this distance here is equal to the sine of that over that distance there. That's just the sine rule. Uh, so you rearrange for x, uh, you get an expression for x given uh, this distance and all that, and distance is just previously calculated. Since it's all done in code, if you've calculated it once, you can just store it as a variable, there's no need to calculate it again. So then uh, put x, add it to the initial bearing, and apply the mod. That's a final expression for the gun bearing, for the gun train. So yeah, that's my explanation over four different A4 pages of how the maths of this turret aimer works. I actually, I didn't search any of this up at all. I just did this as a fun activity over the holidays. Of course, as you would doing random maths questions over the holidays. So yes, that's how the maths works. See you in the next video.